Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be discussing Act 4, Scene 1 of The Tempest, and I'm going to provide you with some background information regarding the court mask and some of the mythological references that Shakespeare makes in the context of Prospero's play within the play. The court mask, let's say, or the masks that he performs or has his spirits perform for Ferdinand and Miranda in order to confer blessings on their relationship and the marriage that is to ensue. Much of this lecture is going to be theoretical, and then we'll see how it applies to the specific details of this play and the way in which, in essence, Shakespeare and Prospero alike begin to subvert some of the expectations that we would have for the court mask and incorporate them. <clears throat> so in order to understand what Prospero and Shakespeare alike are doing, we have to understand something about the court mask and its function as a kind of play or performance that was actually put on for generally royal audiences, kings and queens, dukes, nobles, and lords. The court mask was a particular kind of play. It had its own expectations, its conventions, the different scenes and acts and components that went into it. So just as we think about a play and we know that it's structured in terms of acts, scenes, and lines, we think about a poem like, let's say, a sonnet and how the sonnet is supposed to be structured, let's say in a Shakespearean sonnet with three quatrains and then a couplet that concludes it. Right. Based on these structures, we know what to anticipate for a particular literary form. Well, the court mask had its own structure, this uh, ordered system by which the court mask was supposed to be played out. Also, it has its own conventions and expectations. And we're going to talk a little bit about what those are and what the nature of the genre was to better understand the play that, sh that Prospero puts on for Ferdinand and Miranda that is like a, the analog of a court mask or is in itself a court mask. The court mask was a kind of lavish theatrical production that was performed for royals. So it was meant to be this extravagant, incredibly lavish, resplendent form of entertainment that also served as fantastical spectacle. So it would incorporate all these different varieties of entertainment from uh, poetry recitation to dance, music and song, and the costumes and the special effects such as they could well actually bring into effect in this context were as um, impressive as they could possibly arrange. The objective was to create this atmosphere of magic and mystery, something that was beyond the normal, something that was beyond anything that could be produced in the real world, something beyond the physical, beyond the real, beyond the mundane, all for this courtly audience. Frequently, the figures that appeared inside these court masks would draw upon or would be allusions to classical mythology from the Greeks and the Romans. And we already have a play that's suffused with that, with things like uh, Joe's own thunderbolt and the harpies and the like. So this play has established a series of different allusions and references back to Greek mythology. And here in this climactic moment of the play, in the execution of the play within the play, this spectacle performed by Prospero spirits, we have another series of illusions layered on top of each other. Not only in the regular real world court mask were there references back to the gods and mythological figures from Greece and Rome, so too in the play do we have actual gods and goddesses, it seems, stepping onto the stage. These plays would often refer back to or reflect an idealized golden world. <clears throat> the purpose of these plays was to present in the court mask a golden world that is sustained by the power of the gods. This golden world is like the Garden of Eden, an idyllic, perfect world free from chaos, free from sin, free from discordant music. The lavish spectacle then, and the golden world that's presented therein, is meant to reflect the rulership of the kings or the rulership of the royals uh, to whom this play is being presented. The play was thus didactic and propagandistic. Didactic means that it conveys a kind of moral lesson and propagandistic in that it uh, valorizes, glorifies, and legitimizes the rule of kings or the rules of the royals for whom this court mask is being performed. The divine figures inside the play are meant to either represent or to reflect the role of kings, queens, dukes, all the various different courtiers and the like in the real world. So there's a parallel between what you're supposed to see on stage being represented there and what actually in the propaganda of the play goes on in the real world. The golden world inside the play is sustained by these divine figures like the gods therein. The wonderful world of the real world is sustained by the order imposed by the royals. So there's this parallelism between the fantasy, the imagination, the possibilities inside the fiction that's being portrayed and the real world that they are trying to comment on. 
these plays are also based on the movement between chaos and order. You have, at one point, the mask, which is full of resplendent uh, music, radiant costumes, order, peace, and harmony in its visuals and in its music. You also have these chaotic counterpoints to those moments in the play. These counterpoints are instances where chaos seems to threaten to overcome everything. So the music, instead of being harmonious and beautiful, becomes discordant and clashing and unpleasant. Different hideous figures enter onto the stage. However, eventually the order reimposes itself. It subsumes the chaos within itself and controls it. The purpose of this alteration between the mask and the anti-mask, which we'll talk about in a minute with all this chaos and disorder, the purpose of having that order reimpose itself was to parallel again the roles of the kings and the monarchs. As in the fiction where order reimposes itself over chaos through the action of the gods, so is it in the real world with the actions of royal figures who impose themselves over chaos and restrain it in, or, in order to protect their people and to bring a kind of justice and structure to the real world for their subjects. The climactic moment of the mask of the overall performance occurs when all the actors on stage render into reality the fiction on the stage. They do so by actually departing the stage. They step off the stage into the real world, commingling with the audience, and then they perform a last piece of the performance, a last dance, as it were, with the audience. What they're saying through that moment as the actors step off the stage is that suddenly we're taking this fictional presentation of like the role of kings allegorized in the form of these gods, and we're bringing it into the real world. We're reminding you that what you saw on stage is exactly what's going on in the real world. Now, for a play that is as steeped in metatheatricality as The Tempest, with basically the author of the play, or the playwright himself, Prospero, standing inside the play, writing it as it goes on, nothing could be more germane to Shakespeare's purpose. His attempt to comment on the role and the nature of the play, of fiction itself. In the climax of this play, you have actors stepping off the stage to say, as it is in fiction, so is it in the real world. What we've been doing all along hasn't been fake at all. We've always been saying something about the real world and how the royals function and the, the role that they play. The performance and the divine right of, of uh, rule and this move from chaos into controlling order imposed by the gods is now no longer confined to the stage. It's something that we now see played out in the real world. And it's like a proclamation or a promise. As it is in fiction, may it be as well in the real world in your rule, you royals with whom we are now mingling. These court masks were often used to celebrate political occasions and weddings. So what we have here is Prospero celebrating the impending wedding and trying to bless the wedding between Ferdinand and Miranda. In order to understand, again, the relationship between what's going on in this play, the mask and uh, the uh, play of the Tempest, and what Prospero is attempting to do, we have to understand the, the nature of the mask and the anti-mask. The mask is that play, right, where you have all of these different components and you also have that order imposed by the gods. The anti-mask is like a comedic counterpoint to the mask. It's those moments of the comedic and the grotesque that in the context of the Tempest as a whole play seem to be represented by Stefano, Trinculo, and Caliban, right? Three drunken monstrous creatures or people wandering about the island having foppish ridiculous adventures getting paced down by bees and pinched up in their insides. They're a comedic counterpoint just as Caliban himself is this monstrous and grotesque counterpoint. The point of these anti-masks with their comedic figures and their grotesque figures, which again is paralleled in The Tempest with the representation of Caliban, Stefano, and Trinculo, is to serve as a counterpoint to the resplendent order, beauty, and harmony of the mask. So the royals or the gods, and by parallel the royals in the real world, seem all the more refined, noble, and dignified because they're set against, they're contrasted against the monstrous humor and the body humor of the anti-mask. Now, this is how the mask is supposed to operate. However, as we're going to see, Shakespeare is trying to do with the mask that he presents is a good deal more complex than that. He's in fact subverting many of the aspects of the mask by turning it on his head. 
in order to understand how he does that, we have to look at Prospero's intentions for the mask, what it is that he hopes to accomplish, and then we can compare that with the conclusion of the mask to see the re real relationship between the anti-masks of Caliban and what Prospero is trying to do and fails to do through the mask that he orchestrates using his spirits. Prospero's mask is in fact a complex reformulation of the traditional mask. Now, the mask is designed to illustrate the power of the king right, that Prospero is kind of serving as the analog for. He's the one who organizes the mask. He's the royal, the duke, who has been supplanted and wants to regain his dukedom. The intention behind this mask is, in the context of it, to banish the sexual threat to Miranda of Ferdinand's love. That is, Cupid, Venus, and the myth of their interactions. So we'll look at that in a minute, but we're looking at this in sort of overall arcing terms. We have appearances of Cupid and Venus, two Grecian or Roman deities that are basically the embodiments of lust and dangerous kinds of love that might threaten to undermine Prospero's plan for a generative, sanctified union between Ferdinand and Miranda. Other figures from mythology enter into the performance in order to convey their blessings on the union between Ferdinand and Miranda, and we're going to look at some of those to better understand them. One of the figures that appears is Iris, the heavenly bow, as she is described in the play. Iris is the Roman goddess of the rainbow. In her role as a figure in this mythology, she serves as a kind of connection point between the gods and man. Now, the reason for her inclusion in this play is that well, the mask itself is meant to be that point of connection between gods and man. The gods inside the play are actually the representations of the royals in the real world. Now, it takes on, as Iris comes into the play, as a spirit or an actor, or perhaps even, if Prospero is that powerful, the goddess herself. She blesses the union between Ferdinand and Miranda. There is also a Christian resonance to Iris's appearance. She is the heavenly bow, the rainbow in the sky. For Christian or for a Christian audience at this time, they would be reminded of the covenant that God made with Noah. The Noetic Flood is a story that many of you are probably familiar with. In Noah's Flood, God looks on the earth. He sees how wicked and evil man has become in this ancient past and repents of making man. So he determines to wipe out all life on earth, uh, save for Noah and his family. And so he goes to Noah, commands Noah to construct a massive ark, a massive boat. And into it, he takes varying numbers of clean and unclean animals. It's not actually two by two, as that colloquialization of the myth goes, or as the story goes. Um, there were actually seven of different kinds of animals, but that's neither here nor there. The details are not important. So Noah takes these animals and his family members onto the ark. They survive this global flood that wipes out all other human beings and the other animals on the earth. And then he goes on uh, to essentially repopulate the earth with these animals. After the destruction of the earth, after the flood waters have receded, God forms a covenant with Noah. And he promises to Noah that he will never again destroy the earth through a flood in the same way. And the sign of that covenant is the rainbow. So it's a, a gesture towards the covenant that's made between God and man. In the same way, there's this kind of divine sanctification that is imposed on the prospective wedding of Ferdinand and Miranda that takes its resonance from both the Greek mythology and Christian beliefs. Iris is also associated with the bountiful abundance of harvest, right? the, the kinds of fecundity and growth that results from the rain. Juno, or Hera, the queen of the gods, appears as well. Now, Hera, or Juno, is the goddess of women and marriage. So in the same way that Prospero is trying to seal their marriage with blessings through the spectacle of his art, he's trying to promise this to them and uh, uh, impose these blessings on them to stamp his seal of approval on their relationship. Uh, he also calls upon this goddess of marriage to bless it. Now, Juno is a queen of the gods, so she brings a kind of political or stately blessing on them. So what we already have is a divine blessing connecting God to man. We have the political and stately blessing, and in a moment we're going to look at natural abundance and natural blessing. So in all these areas of politics, the divine, and also in natural kind of fecundity, we have Prospero trying to seal all the various different realms of their interactions, of the interactions between Ferdinand and Miranda.
lastly, we have Ceres, the goddess of the harvest. Now, in uh, the context of Roman wedding ceremonies, Ceres's torch, so this flaming torch of Ceres, would oftentimes lead the marriage procession. The purpose of this was to convey a kind of blessing of fertility and fecundity, of natural abundance, so that the wedding would be blessed by the goddess, so people could have, or the, the couple could have, many children. Ceres, in her description in this wedding mask, is here to provide a kind of blessing of children and natural abundance on Ferdinand and Miranda. So in all these different areas, Prospero is using the power of his art. He's trying to demonstrate the power of his art through both the spectacle and his purported ability to impose these blessings or confer these blessings onto Ferdinand and Miranda. However, not all ends well. Things go awry for Prospero at the end of this play, or I should say at the end of the play within the play that he is staging. Now that you know what Prospero is trying to do, and you have a bit of an understanding of the underlying mythological figures behind this work, you can better approach this story and the concluding moments to this play, or I should say again, this play within the play. So we have a few discussion questions, and these are questions I'm going to ask you when we come to our actual interactive class.